Oshkosh designs, manufactures, and markets specialty vehicles, truck bodies, and access equipment for defense, fire departments, refuse hauling, concrete placement companies, and airports. It owns Pierce Manufacturing, the largest fire truck manufacturer in the world. It also owns JLG Industries, a leading manufacturer of lift equipment, including aerial lifts, boom lifts, scissor lifts, and telehandlers. It is organized in four primary business groups, access equipment, defense, the third group is fire and emergency, and the fourth is commercial. In February of this year, it was awarded the U.S. Postal Service's mail truck contract to produce between 50,000 and 165,000 units over 10 years. The fleet will include internal combustion engine vehicles, as well as battery electric vehicles. The losing bidder was Workhorse, who protested the decision. It's not too much of a surprise. Oshkosh has been around over 100 years. It averages $20 million of revenue per day this past year. Workhorse generated a total of $3 million of revenue in the past 12 months. So who would you go with, a billion dollar company like Oshkosh or a company like Workhorse, who delivers hardly any vehicles throughout the year? Oshkosh is headquartered in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and was founded in 1917. It started trading in 85 and can be found on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 7.7 .7 billion market cap. They're trading at 113 a share, and they have 69 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future, and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flows, cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So their free cash flow was pretty consistent from 2018 to 2019. It dropped a lot in 2020, but it was the highest in the trailing 12 months at close to $1 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses, and that's pretty consistent year to year. It's close to half a billion in the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that peaked in 2019. It dropped a lot in 2020, but it has come up in the trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. So here's a breakdown of their revenue by segment. So you can see in 2019, access equipment was over $4 billion, and that dropped a lot to $2.5 billion. Defense actually increased from $2 billion to $2.3 billion. Fire and emergency and commercial dropped a little from 2019 to 2020. The company does mention in their 10K that COVID was a big reason for lower demand in access equipment and the commercial segments. But you can see revenue is up in the trailing 12 months, so things are improving from 2020. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses that are directly related to generating the revenue. The cost of materials and supplies is a big cost of revenue for this company. Also, payroll is another cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that peaked in 2019 like their revenue. It dropped a lot in 2020 and came up in a trailing 12 months. Below that is operating expenses, and their big operating expense is payroll. So you have payroll in cost of revenue and in operating expenses. So the payroll for the employee working on the front line and building the products goes in the cost of revenue. The people not building the products, like the administrative assistant, the people in accounting and legal, that goes in the operating expenses. And below that is operating income, which also peaked in 2019, dropped in 2020, and came up in the 12 months. They paid $48 million of interest on their debt. They did pay $71 million in 2018. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income which did peak in 2019, but the trailing 12-month net income is actually higher than 2018, even though 2018 has higher revenue. It's mainly because they pay $23 million less on interest expense in the trailing 12 months when compared to 2018. So their income statement looks pretty clean. There's not these large numbers in other income and expenses. Because sometimes companies pass through like a billion dollars in asset impairments, and that makes their net income look negative, even if they had a good year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they did generate the most operating cash flow in the trailing 12 months, even though they had the most revenue in 2019. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, and then you have to add back the non-cash items on the income statement. Their main non-cash item was depreciation. It was $121 million. Now it's $108 million. The reason their operating cash flow was so high in the trailing 12 months 
was its positive $465 million in changes in working capital. In the prior years, it was negative. So when a company uses accounts payable, it buys items on credit. That's similar to taking a loan, so that increases your cash flow. But when you pay for the item, it's a cash negative. When you buy a lot of inventory, that's a cash negative. When you actually use the inventory as part of your production process, that's a cash flow positive. With accounts receivable, if you extend a lot of credit to customers, that's a cash negative. When they actually pay you for the products, that's a cash positive. They have 1.8 billion of accounts receivables. So they may have extended a lot of credit in the past few years, and then they're receiving a lot of money now. So changes in working capital kind of evens out over time. So if you sell $100 million of products on credit, you don't receive any cash. So it's a negative 100 million for that time period. But when you receive the cash, it may be the following year. Then it's a positive $100 million. In most of my videos, I usually say I like to look at operating cash flow. That's a better indicator of how the company's doing. But in this case, since they have so much changes in working capital, I would say operating income on the income statement is a better indicator. And this company has a pretty clean income statement. They don't have a lot of non-cash items. So I would look at the income statement for this company as a strong indicator for how the company's doing. But like I said earlier, if a company has a lot of non-cash items, like a large asset impairment, that could really drag down their net income to negative, even if they generated positive cash flow. So they are a manufacturing company, so they have to spend in CapEx. They have to buy equipment and factories to make the products. So they spend between $100 million and $174 million in CapEx each year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do have a good amount of free cash flow each year. So they were buying back stock in 2018 and 19. They didn't really buy back much stock in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. But you can see in 2018, they issued a similar amount of debt as they paid off. Same thing in 2020. But their interest expense is so much lower than in 2018 when compared to the trailing 12 months. How can that be if they have the same amount of debt? The way a company pays less interest on its debt with having the same amount of debt is the debt they paid down had a high interest rate around 5 or 6%. And then the debt they issued had a low interest rate, like 2 or 3%. That's how you lower your interest expense and keep the same amount of debt. This is the equity section of their balance sheet, and they have $3.3 billion of equity. They raised $800 million from issuing stock, and they bought back over $460 million of stock. Treasury stock is a stock you buy back, and you put it onto your balance sheet. It's a contra equity account, so you have to minus it from stockholders' equity. And they generated over $3 billion of profit after paying dividends. So this company has been around a long time. They're profitable. They have a really healthy balance sheet. So it appears to be a really safe investment. Let's look at the capital structure. $3.2 billion of equity, $800 million of debt. They're 80% equity, 20% debt. Their net debt is negative $348 million. So they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have $348 million of cash left over. Their weighted average cost of capital is 8%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $8.4 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $7.5 billion. We divide that by 69 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 109. They're trading at 113, so they're trading at a 4% premium. It is a sell according to the model, but it's pretty close to where they're trading at. The way I value their future free cash flows, I use my model. I actually have four models, the median, the average, the min, and the max. I have a video explaining how I calculate the future free cash flows. I usually use the median model for most companies. Of course, if the company has negative free cash flow, the model won't work. I have to somehow estimate their future free cash flows. But this company has pretty stable numbers. And you can see how it smoothed out the future free cash flows, even though they had that big jump in the trailing 12 months. Simply Wall Street values the company at $92 a share. They're saying it's 23% overvalued. Six analysts priced this stock, and they're all pretty bullish. The average price target was $143. That's probably due to the post office contract they were awarded recently. This is where the stock has been trading since 1985, so it looks like it was pretty flat for a really long time, although it is hard to tell with such a long time frame. Then during 2008, the stock crashed during the Great Recession. The stock was in the single digits for a while. But then it's come back up, and the stock doubled from the end of 2020 to a few months ago. It did regress a little bit. That's mainly because it was in a running to win that contract. So this is where the stock has been trading the last 12 months. 
The main reason the stock price came up so much because it was in the running for that post office contract. Then when it won the contract, the stock price actually came down. That's pretty common because in anticipation of winning that contract, the stock price was driven up. And then when they actually got the contract, people took in their profits and the stock price came down a little bit. You can see it didn't come down too much, but it's trading a lot higher than it was 12 months ago. If they didn't get the contract, the stock price would have came down a ton like Workhorse. You can see Workhorse's stock was pushed up to about $40 a share. And then when they did not get the contract, the stock crashed to below $10. If they did get the contract, it probably would have settled around $30 to $35. The reason the stock price comes down, whether the company wins the contract or loses the contract, is because the stock market is forward thinking. People knew about this contract, so they bid the price higher. If this contract came out of the blue, then the stock would have shot up overnight. It's the same as if a company meets their earnings estimate. The stock price may come down a little bit. If they fall short of their estimate, the stock price will come down a lot. If they crush their estimate, then the stock price will go up a lot. But people are buying the stock price in anticipation of them meeting their target. So when they actually meet it, it does retract a little bit. They raise their dividend each year from 21 cents up to 33 cents. They pay a 1.17% dividend yield, or 117 basis points. They can easily afford this. They pay out 19% of their net income, 9% of their free cash flow. So they have a lot of money left over to even raise a dividend if they wanted to. And their industry pays a 1.5% dividend. They're a little lower than their industry. Their stock moves about one and a half times the market. They have a beta of 1.54. The stock is up 43% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 29%. The 52-week low was 67, the high was 137, and the stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average. The stock isn't too popular. About half a million shares are traded each day. Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float. 91% of the shares are held by institutions. So when a company has a high institutional ownership, that's generally considered a good thing because institutions are considered smart money. Plus, they have tons of money to throw around. They can buy millions, tens of millions, or up to hundreds of millions of shares at one time, where investors like us can't buy nearly that many. About 2.5% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past year, three years, and five years, the stock has gone up similar to its industry and the market. Analysts are projecting their earnings to grow 13% and their revenue to grow 7.5%. That's a little less than their industry and the market. In the past five years, their annual earnings are up 12%. In the past year, it's up 29%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd be really happy at $73,000 today. That's a 22% annual return. Since they have so much institutional ownership, it's not surprising their biggest shareholders are Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, Boston Partners, and LSV. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have great price multiples. They have a PE of 16, which is much better than a market median and average. PE is stock price over earnings per share. They have a great price to sales ratio, it's about one. That means their revenue is pretty similar to their market cap. And their price to book is also really good at 2.4. They do have a good amount of intangible assets on their balance sheet, 1.5 billion. So they have acquired other businesses to grow their company. They have a great return on invested capital of 18%. They can cover their interest payments 12 times. And they have a great ROE, 15%. And companies with lots of debt can inflate their ROE. They don't have too much debt and they still have a really good ROE. And they have a solid current ratio and quick ratio. They have 1.2 billion of cash on their balance sheet. Remember earlier when we look at the cash flow from operations section, I mentioned they seem to extend a lot of credit. They have 1.8 billion of receivables. And they have 1.3 billion of inventory. They are really well capitalized. They had 1 billion of free cash flow in internally 12 months, over 2.2 billion of working capital and only $91 million of dividend payments, so they have $3.15 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry, I've done videos of two other companies in the same industry as Oshkosh, and if Oshkosh has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they have the best PE, the best price to sales by far, the best price to book. All the companies are doing well in current ratio. Caterpillar has a great ROE. Oshkosh is still pretty good at 15%. Caterpillar does have a good amount of debt. The other two companies are pretty low. And Caterpillar is a giant company, $119 billion market cap. You can see IDEX has a $1 billion market cap, but they bring in hardly any revenue relative to their market cap, 17.8 price to sales ratio. Where Oshkosh, $7.8 billion market cap, they bring in a similar amount of revenue as their market cap. 
That just shows you how much stronger of a company Oshkosh is than IDEX. Although IDEX seems to be a meme stock, so it may get more activity. And Oshkosh pays a decent dividend, but Caterpillar pays a much better dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 4% premium, but this company seems to be a solid long-term investment. It seems to be pretty low risk. Plus with that post office contract, that could really boost their revenue. And if they get other big contracts like that, the stock price may double again. I rank their free cash flows 8 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.